of God and, and bringing them to an environment where the focus changes from the world and what's outside. It's not focused on any, anyone in the church. It's a focus on them. And, you know, sometimes you just need a little special treatment. Amen? Sometimes we all just need a little special uh, attention. And we're going to give them that attention, make them feel special. And uh, we're going to have two great speakers. Sister Jan Aldridge will be there and also uh, another lady. Her, I can't remember her name right now. Sister Pam? Lynn? Oh, Sister Lynn Demmel. Uh, I was trying to think of the other lady who's over that. T- Tina Davenport? Tammy Davenport, thank you. Uh, Tammy Davenport, so we've got a lot of special guests, special speakers. Uh, the ladies will be truly blessed by them. And then Sister Jan will be remaining with us for Sunday through Wednesday. However, as a part of that announcement, we will not be having service that Monday night because we do our, well, we'll have our, our prayer time, of course, and we also have our big night with our food pantry and our outreach there. And Sister Jan, I talked to her a couple of days ago, and she's in 100% agreement with that. Uh, and plus, I'm sure she... Uh, appreciates the night off so amen gives her a chance to have a break so we got a lot of good things happening uh you say pastor what what do i do if i want to be involved in something well just just talk to somebody look someone up uh that uh, that you know is involved in the church and get connected and uh, do something for god there's plenty of room for everybody to work amen and again thank you for all those cookies it is sad that i never got one but i I, you know, fi- what happened? There was 400 dozen. There ended up being 500 dozen. Surely a dozen could have made their way through the church somehow. I don't understand. But anyway, that's just my thing. I just think out of the box, you know, the cookie box, so to speak. Amen. They made their way through the church. We just didn't get any. Amen. Thank you, Nick, for that. Thank you. That explains it all, doesn't <laughs> Amen. Well, praise God. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me this morning in the Scripture to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, chapter 1. We're going to start with verse 1. It's going to be a moment before I get there, but I I want to introduce this morning the the message. I want to talk about barrenness to birthing. Often the Holy Spirit uses historical events in the Old Testament to give us a prophetic picture of what God is currently doing in, in the church and in the body of Christ. And I can tell you we're, we're living in a world that is very tumultuous. You know that. I don't have to tell you that. We're living in a very critical moment. We're living in a pivotal moment in the history of this world. Not just in the history of America, but in the history of this world. We're living at a very pivotal time. Do do we understand this morning that certain decisions made change the total outlook of what this planet is going to look like in the future? One decision. And you don't make those decisions. And I don't make those decisions. There are other people involved and and other other parties involved. People in, in other positions and people with power making decisions that affect you and I. We're living in that kind of time. It's a time of uncertainty, a time of unrest, a time of turmoil and confusion. But I want to tell you this morning that I believe the Word of God has the answer for us. I've been waiting, I've been praying, I've been listening. As a pastor, it's my, it's my job to lead the charge. It's my job to, to be ready. It's because I'm responsible, as you would understand, I'm responsible to, to bring to you and to bring to the body of Christ a word of encouragement, a word of direction, a word that helps us get on the right track and stay on the right track until Jesus comes so that we'll be ready to meet Him when He does. I will tell you that is an ominous responsibility. But because the Word of God is alive, I trust it. You see, the Word of God is alive. It's timeless. It's limitless. It's always relevant. It is transcendent. The old is contained in the new. And the new is completed in the old. 
It is in the scripture today I wish to share to you as I've asked the Holy Spirit over the last few months following the, the COVID pandemic, the sociological upheavals and changes in our world, the radical effect of all these things along with our global issues now. The things we have had in the church. And I've been searching the scriptures. I've been praying to God for answers and direction. But I really feel as I was sitting in, in our prayer conference the other evening and as I was sitting there and I was listening to a man bring the word of God and he used this scripture. And he used this story and, and the Holy Spirit as he, as he was talking, the Holy Spirit opened my heart and I, I began to, tears began to well up in my eyes and I began to realize, God, you're, you're giving me the answer to, to my questions. Because my, I, I'm not responsible for the Potter's House Church in Columbus. I'm not responsible for the Princeton Pike Church in, in Hamilton. I'm not responsible. I am responsible for this house as the shepherd of this house. And I take that very seriously. And as the, being the responsible one to, to lead and guide and direct and provide vision and mission for the body of Christ, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart through that man's word and the Holy Spirit began to deal with me and I realized where the answer lies. This word may be a little hard for some this morning. It may be a little hard. But all I can tell you is it is the word of God. It is meat for you. And if it seems hard, just chew a little more. Amen? And you say, well, pastor, I have false teeth and that's hard for me. Just, well, just do your best. Why has the church been so seemingly ineffective in the last 20 years? Almost 80% of America do not claim a relationship with Jesus Christ. 80, over 80% does not claim a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's over 200 million people. Did you hear that number? Two, over 200 million people in our nation that are unsaved. That are not in churches this morning. 15 to 18% of Americans attend church on average on a Sunday morning. And in a nation that initially was founded upon biblical principles, where church was the norm, where serving God was the norm and not the exception. Today, it's the exception. And I feel this story today answers some questions for us. I hope, it'll, I hope the Holy Spirit will allow it to sink into your heart and your mind. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Let's, let's begin. I want to first talk about the people. I'll get to the text in a moment, but I, I want to introduce this this way. First, the people involved in this story. The first one I, I would mention is a man by the name of Elkanah. Now, Elkanah was a Levite of Mount Ephraim. He lived in Ramah, which is the New Testament city of Arimathea, where Joseph, who took the body of Jesus when he was crucified, took the body of Jesus down and placed it in a tomb. That was Joseph of Arimathea. Same city. It's a city about uh, 20 miles from Jerusalem. He was a faithful man. You, we read the scripture. He was faithful. He was consistent to worship. To the annual feast of God. He was a man of integrity. But he had a problem. And the problem he had was he practiced polygamy. Though it was against the original law. Yet in that day it was common among the Hebrews that if their, their first wife could not bear children to the husband then they commonly practiced polygamy and they would bring another wife so that the husband's seed could continue on, his heritage and lineage. It wasn't God's law. It wasn't necessarily God's direction. It was man's 
way of dealing with a problem. And in this situation, Elkanah, who was married to Hannah, his first wife, who could not bear children, and I want to I want to tell you this up front. The Bible says the Lord had shut her womb. That's significant. God had shut her womb. And then the Bible says that when Elkanah mar married the second wife, Penina, that she bare him many children. But you see, Penina was a different character she was peevish and provoking she was a woman who taunted Hannah for her barrenness no doubt jealous and exasperated of the first wife Hannah whom Elkanah affectionately favored even though she could not bring bear him children without question it was a divided family it was a family that was truly dysfunctional Elkanah loved Hannah even though she was barren and showed her favor. And I want to tell you what a, what a picture of Jesus Christ there. That even when we're spiritually unfruitful, even, we, even when, the Bible says, even when we were sinners, Christ died for us and loved us. That's favor. That's grace. And I want to tell you, if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ, it's not that you loved him, but that he loves you. And he died for you. And he died for us on a cross, even when we were sinners. But jealousy and division rule the house. Can you imagine Elkanah's position as, as the husband? <laughs> you ask for it, you get it. Listen, I'm married to one amazing woman, but I don't know how anyone could handle two. Woo, hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. You men ought to be saying amen right now, right about now. Especially when there's such a an angst between the two. One lords over the other, one exasperates the other by the nature of her kindness and generosity and the fact that she's, she's the, the beloved wife and the other one, the other one is full of anger and bitterness and jealousy and yet she's the one, she's the one that is fruitful. Then there's a man by the name of Eli in this story I'm going to share with you. Eli's the priest, he's the high priest and he's a descendant of Aaron. He has two sons. Hophni and Phinehas. Interestingly, don't name your child Hophni. Because it means tadpole. Who would name their son tadpole? Now you might, you might use that as a nickname, but that's a terrible thing to name him. And then of course there was Phinehas, which means southerner. Thank you, Dr. Jack, for putting that up there. Eli had an impeccable record as a priest, but he had a problem. He was a terrible father. Spiritual people can be terrible fathers, terrible mothers, unfortunately. His sons were worthless and corrupt men who promoted prostitution through their position in the priesthood at the temple. And I, I draw your attention to 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 22. Listen, now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel and how they lay with women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Ooh, what a mess. They would come to the, the place of the tabernacle this happened to be in a place called Shiloh, and it, the Bible says that these men prostituted the women, these two priests of God. And he said unto them, why do you such things? 
For I hear your evil dealings with all this people. Nay, my sons, for it is not good. Report that I hear you make the Lord's people to, to sin or transgress. He's, sm he's just smacking them on the hand. 1 Samuel 2, 12. Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. Now the word Belial is represented of the, of the devil in the Old Testament. They knew not the Lord. Hold on a minute, they're priests. Hold on, they're priests of God. They're those who minister in the temple on behalf of the other people. That's what a priest was. He was one who represented God to the people and the people to God. He was that go-between. The word priest means is the word pontifex, which means bridge builder. And a, a priest was bridging the gap between God and, and man. And these priests, these two sons, the Bible says they don't even, they knew not the Lord. What does that mean, Pastor? What does it say to us? It says you, you can do ministry and not know the Lord. That's sad. That's tragic. That there are people doing ministry. There are people that are operating in, in ministry. There are people who are, who are operating in churches who do not know the Lord. And, and that is tragic. Breaks your heart to think that there are people who are, who are, who are that insincere in what they're doing. Because of their evil doings flagrantly in the sight of God and in the house of God, God spoke through the prophet that they would be judged and that they would be slain. There's a lot of flagrant things going on in the world today. And as I began to think about this scripture, as God began to reveal this to my spirit, I began to realize that there's a lot of things just being openly put in the face of God flagrantly. You name it, it's happening in our world and in our nation, and it is not pleasing to God, but people do it openly and flagrantly. And God says it's an abomination, it is sin, and yet people do it flagrantly. They parade it in the streets. We, 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 they, people do it openly. There's no shame to it. And yet the Bible says it's sin. It's an abomination to God and they do it anyway. It's not my judgment. It's just the word of God that says there are some things, folks, in our world that, is, that are sinful. And peep, those sinful people are just flagrantly throwing it in the face of God and in this world. And I, I have a responsibility as a minister of the gospel to say this. The Bible says the soul that sins shall surely die. The, the Bible tells us that sin is the transgression of the law and God's law says certain things. Hophni and Phinehas were, were within the ministry but they were breaking the law of God flagrantly in the face of God. And God says, I will judge and they will die. When the Hebrews were in battle, soon after this, a few chapters later in the book of Samuel, we find the children of Israel, the Hebrew people, are in battle with the Philistines. And the people request that the Ark of the Covenant be brought from Shiloh to the battlefield, Shiloh was the, where the temple was before it was eventually moved to Jerusalem. And they wanted them to bring the, the Ark of the Covenant from Shiloh to Ebenezer to the battlefield. Hophni and Phinehas, being the priests, escorted the Ark of the Covenant to the battlefield where they, along with 30,000 other Israelites, were slaughtered by the Philistines. God says they will said they will die. When Eli the priest got the news, Eli the priest had probably made his way somewhere into the direction of the battlefield out of harm's way, but close enough to where he could get the news from the battlefield. And the Bible says, sitting by the road side, waiting for the news from the battlefield, he fell over backwards, broke his neck, and died. 
Then there's the place. I'll say no more there. I'm going to, I'm going to move on. The place was Shiloh. Shiloh was a city about 20 miles north of Jerusalem and was the place where the tabernacle was until it was captured by the Philistines in this very battle I just spoke of. They captured the ark. They took it off to Ashdod. They took it off into the cities of the Philistines and it would not return until it was relocated in Jerusalem in the final return to the Israelites. Now I've just talked about some of the people involved in the story. Notice I haven't mentioned Hannah because she's, she's going to be the focus from here on out. And I talked about Eli. I talked about the concept of, of the priest and the involvement of the, let's call Eli the representative of the, the traditional church. And we go to 1 Samuel chapter 1. I want you to Hear the word of the Lord. Now there was a certain man of Ramath, a theme, Zophim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, and Ephrathite, and he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, the name of the other Penina, and Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts. In Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Peninnah his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. Now what that literally means is, is that when they went up to these annual feasts, of course, they gave portions to the family to feed them. And the Bible says that all of the family members got a portion. But notice what it says. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion. Now if you look look at that word worthy, it literally represents the fact that whatever God gave Penina, he gave Hannah a double portion of what he gave everybody else. For he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. That's significant. Do you... Does the question come to you immediately? Why did God shut up her womb? I understand natural causes. I understand natural infirmities, sickness and disease that would cause a woman not to be able to bear a child. But why did God shut up her womb? We'll address that in just a moment, but keep that in mind. And her adversary, well, we know who that was. That was Penina, but her adversary, you know, the Bible says the devil is our adversary. And he goes about as a roaring lion, 1 Peter 5 and 8, seeking whom he may devour. She had an adversary, and the adversary happened to be the other woman in her home. Provoked her, her sore for to make her fret. Because the Lord had shut up her womb, and as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah, her husband, to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after that she had eaten in Shiloh, or after they had eaten in Shiloh, she didn't eat. And after they had drunk, now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post in the temple of the Lord. Remember what I said, Eli represents the traditional church. Verse 10, and she was in the bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, that's Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, the host of heaven, the Lord who commands all the, the armies of heaven. That's what that name means, Jehovah, Sabaoth, Lord of hosts. If thou will indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaiden and remember me, here's her prayer, and not forget my thine handmaiden, but will give unto thine handmaiden a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life. And there shall no razor come upon his head. And it shall come to pass as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked or he paid attention to her mouth 
Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long will you be drunken? Put away the wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. I don't know if you've ever seen anyone grieving. I don't know if you've ever seen anyone just crying vehemently through, because of grief and pain and loss. But I will tell you, most of the time it's not a pretty thing. And Eli saw Hannah in this condition. She literally made her way to the house of God, fell on the steps before the altar of God there in the outer court, and she began to weep, and she wept, and she wept so vehemently, she cried so, so feverishly, amen, that she got to the place where her mouth would move, but no words would come out. Count not thine handmaiden, verse 16, for a daughter of Belial of the devil. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition. Thank you, Eli, for finally waking up. That's my add in there. And God grant thee... The God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And he said, Let thine handmaiden find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. May God add his blessing to his word. Now let's get, let's get to the heart of the matter. We've talked about the, the place. We've talked about the people. But I now want to talk about Hannah's problem. The Bible says her problem was barrenness and God had closed her womb. Hannah's desire for a child led her to the tabernacle. Her priority was not on the meat proportion to the family at the feast, but on pursuing God on behalf of her desire and her dilemma. She wept and did not eat. She was fasting. The fourth thing I want to call your attention to is then Hannah's prayer based on the problem that she had. Now understand, the problem was not something she had done. It was not something she had created. It wasn't because of something that she had, she had a sickness or anything in her body. God had shut her womb. And I want you to, I want you to think right now about the ineffectiveness of the 21st century church over the last ye several years. Why have we gotten behind in the, even in the growth, the birth rate in America is way ahead of the salvation rate in America? A thousand to twelve hundred ministers every month leave the ministry. Do you hear what I said? Churches closing down. Ministries going under. Church doors shutting. And yet there are places in this world where there's revival happening and the church is growing by leaps and bounds. But notice Hannah's prayer. The Bible says she rose up without eating. She was fasting. She could not eat. And she went to the temple of God. She laid on the steps of the temple and she poured her soul out to God. What motivates us? What drives us to the altar of prayer? What makes us pray? What, must, what makes us even think prayer is necessary? Usually what makes us go to prayer are our wants and our needs. But rarely do we come to the place in prayer where we're, we're willing to give God something in the deal. The Bible says she came to the tabernacle there. She fell on her face before God. She wept and she cried so bitterly that 
Eventually words would not come, only her mouth would move. She was thought to be drunk. Reminds me of a place in Acts chapter 2 when the Bible says that they were filled with the Holy Ghost that day on the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And Peter said, these are not drunk as you think, but this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel, that in the last days I will pour out my Spirit upon all men. They were not drunken, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Hannah was so so enamored by the pa- the pain of not being able to bear and the constant constant bantering of her adversary as she cried out to God God heard her prayer what take what puts you what puts me what puts us church on our knees is it self desire it's okay to desire things as a matter of fact Psalm 37 says you trust God you commit your way unto him and he'll give you the desires of your heart but it comes first with commitment to him But you think about your prayer life. I think about mine. What brings us to our knees? And it relates to exactly what's happening in in our world. It relates to exactly what's happening in the church. I've said, God, what are you doing here at Evangel? What are you doing? You're bringing new people. You're bringing people that are hungry for God. They don't care about position. They don't care about titles. They don't care about uh, anything like that. They just are hungry for God. And they want to do something for God. And they want to give something to God. Lord, what are you doing? Show me. Several weeks ago, I ministered on that that scripture from John's gospel where Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will show you. Russ, I've been praying it for weeks. Lord, show me. You said you would. Lord, show me. I'm nobody special. But God, if you will, your word says you'll show me. Through the Holy Spirit that came into this world. He said, because I go to the Father, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and He will show you things to come. I said, God, show me. And He did. He showed me through this story. Usually wants and needs, but rarely do we give everything we desire back to God for His glory and His kingdom work. Note her vow. She gave God back what she had requested even before she got it. A vow to give Him, which is a form of sacrifice. Oh, by the way, that's a bygone word in the church anymore. We don't like sacrifice. We don't like giving up the things we think we want and God's Word says no. We don't think about sacrifice anymore in the church. We come to the, we, we want something from God and if the church we come to don't have it. It's like Walmart. <laughs> we'll go to one that does. Amen. It's a consumerist mentality that has crept into the world. And if we, we, we're selfish, I'm speaking of us. I'm including myself in this conversation. We're, we're selfish by nature. We want what we want. And if we go to where we go and it don't have what we want, then we'll find a place that gives us what we want. Is that what the Bible says? No. We don't need what we want. We need what we need. We need the truth of the Word of God. We don't need something watered down. We don't need something that's going to make us feel good. Living in sin. Listen, if you're in sin today, you don't need to feel good about it. And I'm not here to make you feel good. If you're doing something wrong that the Bible says you should not be doing, if you're sinning, listen, don't be comfortable. Because I love you too much. I want you to be comfortable, but I want you to be comfortable knowing your sins are forgiven and Jesus is your Savior and you're on your way to heaven. I don't want you to feel comfortable in your sin. What what pastor, what minister of the gospel in his right mind would want to make people feel good if they're living immoral lives and he knows according to the Word that they will go to hell? What minister in his right mind would feel that way? Her prayer was so filled with passion and emotion. Eli said, she's drinking. But notice, fifthly, Eli's prophecy. It says in verse 12 of the same chapter, Eli says this. It came to pass, she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. He thought she's drunken. Let's skip down to verse 17. 
Then Eli answered and said, after he realized she wasn't drunk, after he realized that she was sincere and her heart was broken and she was grieving because of her condition, and Eli answered and said, Go in peace and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. In other words, God answer your prayer. And she said, Let thine handmaiden find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. Number six, God's provision. Verse 19 says, And they rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to her house in Ramah. And Elkanah knew, her, knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore it came to pass when the time was come, about nine months later, after Hannah had conceived, she bare a son and called his name Samuel, because I have asked him of the Lord. There's the answer to her prayer. Her dilemma is now abated. Her problem is now no longer a problem. Her adversary now has nothing to rail on her about. Get ready. I'm going to take you to the conclusion. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, the Bible says, And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. This is her praise, by the way. My horn is exalted to the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over my enemies. Because I rejoice in your salvation, there is none holy as the Lord. For there is none beside you, neither is there any rock like our God. Now she didn't forget, once she got the answer to her prayer, her petition, she didn't forget to give God the praise. So here we go. What is, what is this saying to the church? Where are we right now? Where, are, where is the 21st century church? In all of this, I believe the Holy Spirit is showing us something. Overnight, her, the, her life, Hannah, over her life, Hannah would have three more sons. She would have two more daughters. Because God opened her womb and filled her with expectation. So let's process it. To bring it to the close. How are you going to process this story? I've thrown a lot of things out to you. We've talked about Hannah. We've talked about this, this event in her life. Her problem. We've seen the answer that God gave her to her prayer. We've seen the provision of God, Jehovah Jireh, the God who sees and provides. So as we process it, I want to I say a few things to you, and I've just numbered them. Number one, God may have closed the spiritual womb of the church. Why did God close Hannah's womb? The Bible says God's ways are above our ways and His thoughts above our thoughts. The Bible says the only thing that God ever counsels when He makes a decision is His own sovereign will. He counsels with no man to make any decision. He doesn't call, He doesn't, he doesn't ask pastors and ministers, He doesn't ask us for, for counseling. God counsels His own sovereign will and He makes decisions the Bible says he, he takes down kings, He raises up kings. God has a sovereign plan and a purpose. And I believe God had shut Hannah's womb for a reason. And I believe I find the reason in the analogy it makes to the church. God may have closed the spiritual womb of the church because we have not been in the condition to bear because of division disunity and dysfunction in the church. That's the hard work today. You see, we don't... Ha do we really have the, the, the wherewithal? Do we really have the spiritual strength right now to bring forth people to birth? Listen, if you're going to give birth to something, you've got to be able to sustain it. You've got to be able to take care of it. You've got to be able to give it the proper attention and the prop feed it properly and nourish it properly. Are you following me? 
the 21st century church reminds me of Eli. The Bible says he was sitting in the temple by one of the posts or the pillars of the, of the tabernacle. He's sitting there on a stool. And he's watching those who come, who are ministering. He's overseeing things. He's not really involved, but he is watching. It makes me think of the, the legalistic church, the church that watches people and, and, and judges them and their actions based on what they think. Amen? But God, I believe, may have, clo may have closed her womb intentionally to prove to a nation and to prove to a people that He is God and there are no other gods. And that when it comes to life, He's the life giver. And He can take that which is barren and He can make it give birth. We've been divided too long. Churches need to get together. Church people need to get together. We don't need to be in disunity and we don't need to be dysfunctional. We need to be unified. Why? Because God is wanting us to give birth. But if we can't sustain the birth, God's going to stop the womb until we're ready. Number two. Our frustration over a world that is lost must drive us to the steps of the altar of the house of God in prayer. I said our frustration over lost people must drive us to the house of God, must drive us. Here's some steps, folks, right here, right here. Some. Our, our frustration over what's happening in our world needs to drive us to an altar of prayer. But we're not driven. We're not motivated. What, are, what, what motivates us? What are we looking at? What are we watching for? Listen. I'm talking about giving birth. I'm talking about expectation today. Those of you who are hard of hearing, having ears to hear, they hear not. Having eyes to see, they see not. That has no application in this sense. Just disregard everything I just said. All right. Our frustration over a world that is broken must drive us to prayer. You don't need to be asked to pray. And getting people to pray is like pulling hen's teeth. Some of you caught that right off the bat. Amen. We've got to, have, listen, if, if most of us, if our world's not falling apart, we're not praying. Do, you, do we understand that so many things are rectified when we just take the heart of God and care for lost souls and weep and pray over them, and all of a sudden our miracles start happening? Did you notice, Hannah, her miracle happened? Number three, our prayer must be with brokenness and tears, praying in the Holy Ghost and with understanding, crying out to God to give us spiritual children. And Oh, that's, that's where this thing really starts coming to me. This is where God really starts showing me what we're going through. Listen, there's been a barrenness in the church. There's been a barrenness in ministry. There's been a barrenness. Listen, we've, 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 we have worked hard. People have prayed. People have done a lot of things. We've witnessed. And listen, we, we're, we're just frustrated because we've sowed so much seed, but we've borne so little fruit. And I found myself of recent over the last several months just praying, God, thank you for the seed we've sown. But God, we've sown a lot of seed. It's not right now about sowing seed. Man, Lord, we just need to see some seed come to life. 
Sister Pam and Sister Barbara and all the seed they've sown in the, the, the prison ministry and all the seed that's been sown through outreaches in our church. We've all sown a lot of seed, church. Where's the fruit of that seed? Listen, if we had fruit based on the, the amount of effort we put into it, this place would be packed this morning. So what's missing? The womb may have been closed because God is waiting for us to be prepared properly to bring forth the real harvest. Now listen, I'm not done, but I'm almost done. What does that mean, Pastor? Absolutely nothing. Now notice number four. The fourth thing is we need to refuse the meat and focus on the altar. Hannah was to get a portion of meat and she said, no, I don't want to eat the meat. I've got to go pray. What was she doing? She was putting fit the spiritual above the physical. That's what fasting is. Fasting, fasting is just basically putting ourselves in the place where we say, God, you're first. You're most important right now. I, I will eat later, but right now, this, is pro this takes priority. When do souls take priority in the church again? We got a lot of priorities in the church. We've got to have, now listen, I am so, I'm so thankful for all the things that are happening, but I will tell you that should not be our priority in the church. Men's meeting should not be our priority. Amen? Shouldn't be our priority. Ladies' meeting should not be our priority. The things that we're doing should not be the priorities. We should be doing the things we're doing because we're caring for the children that are being birthed. Ah, imagine that. What a, what a novel principle. So what does that mean? Well, if we put a priority on birthing, if we put a priority like Hannah did on going to God and say, God, give me a child. God, give us spiritual children. God, give the church so Give us souls, God. And we put a priority on that. Listen, everything else will fall into place. We'll have, pro, we'll have to have programs because we got to keep all those children alive. We got to feed them somehow. Amen. Hang on. Hang on. Got to refuse the meat. Everybody say, refuse the meat. Focus on the altar. Number five, our passionate prayer must result in a vow to God, releasing every blessing He gives us back to Him for His glory. You got to, when you ask for it, then you immediately say, God, I give it back to you. Whatever you give me, I'm giving back for your honor, your glory, and the work of the kingdom. Wow. You mean I come and I bring a request to God? I have a petition for God and what God's going to give me, I'm going to give it back, Pastor. That doesn't make sense. Amen. That's what God asked Abraham to do. In Genesis chapter 22, God had given him Isaac, the promised seed of Israel. And, and he had waited for years for that promise. He had tried it himself. He and Hannah, amen, they had brought in a, a handmaiden, Hagar. And Abraham had had a child by Hagar trying to help God out. And not long later, amen, Sarah at 90 years of age ends up pregnant. Amen. And Abraham's 100. Can't even imagine that. And yet God, God gives her a child in her barren womb, in her elevated age. Listen to me, church. We have got to be to that place. In number six, we must understand that the Hannah church is the incoming order. Everybody say the Hannah church. The Hannah church is the incoming order. It's the, the, the paradigm. It's the pattern. It's the new thing that God is doing. It's the Hannah church. It's not the Eli church. The Eli church is on the way out. It's outgoing. Tra the traditionalism, amen, it's what's got us to where we are today. We don't have the power to give birth. We're not in the birthing, amen, we're not... Uh, in the physical state to give spiritual birth. 
And the Holy Spirit is saying to us, the Hannah church is in, the Eli church is out. You get it? Hannah represents a church that is, that is alive. A church that, is, that if there's not birth happening, then we're on the altar praying, seeking God, and believing God, and making it a priority until life comes forth. The Holy Spirit is speaking to us today, church. He's speaking to us very clearly. The sanctuary of the Lord, number seven, must become a labor room and not a lounge. We ought to be having babies in here now. I'm anointed of the Holy Spirit right now. I'll just tell you, it's all over me. Listen, church, I have labored with this. I'm going to tell you, the Holy Spirit, I have wrestled with the Holy Spirit over this over the last few days. And the Holy Spirit, he said, listen, we gotta, we've got to change the paradigm of what we call church. Thank God for COVID. It changed us. It made us look at a different paradigm and realize church is not what it once was. People aren't flooding to the churches because it's the thing to do anymore. Amen. People are, people are not doing that. What we have got to do, we have got to get this place back to a genuine house of God. Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer and you have made it a den of thieves. Amen. What have, what have we robbed? We've robbed God of his ability to bring birth through the church. Make this place a birthing room and not a lounge. Where souls are one to the kingdom. Where we run to the altar. We don't have to have a special prayer program. We ought to have to kick, we ought to have to kick people out about midnight every night. Just say, hey, look, go home and pray. Pastor needs to go home. He's got to eat sometime. He's got to sleep sometime. So go home and pray there. You've prayed all day at the church. We ought to be running people out of the church, not... Finding some way to manipulate them to get in. Did he say that? Yes, he did. Because a lot of what we do, you think about it, church, a lot of the things we do, it's, it's manipulative. Well, we're going to have a special program. We're going to have a special program if we can just get them in. Well, that's manipulation. We ought to have the power of God in this place so strong that people run in here because there's real things happening in our altars. There's real people being saved. There are real lives being healed, Brother Mark. Things are really happening. We're, we're, not, just, we're not just mouth, amen. We're not just moving our lips and nothing's being said, but the real word of God is going forth and truth is prevailing and miracles are happening. Why aren't miracles happening in the church anymore? Amen. Probably for the same reason that we're not giving birth like we should. The sanctuary of the Lord must become a labor room and not a lounge. Pastor, these seats are pretty comfortable. I wish to God 25 year, 20 years ago when we built this place, we hadn't padded them. I'm just teasing. <laughs> Kinda. We're too comfortable in the pew church. Listen, I'm I'm just delivering the message today. If you want to shoot me, go ahead. Now listen, I'm this is a, my last point. And then I want to close with a brief story. The Hannah Church will give birth to that which is authentic, prophetic, and cares about souls. Samuel's anointing of the new king of Israel gives us a picture. Now, I need, I need, seven, I need seven people real quick. Rachel, Nick, come on up here. 
Come on up here. Amen. Sarah, can you can you come up and join? Hey, can you two people come up and help me? Hey, Joe, come up and come up and help me. Do I have six people? Do I have seven people on the platform yet? I said, we got seven. Is that right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. The last time I checked, that was seven. Seven was a seven who went to heaven. Six was a six who couldn't get fixed. That means nothing. Don't just disregard that. All right. God had a man by the name of Saul who became the king of Israel. Saul was head and shoulders above Israel. He was a good looking guy, sharp, gifted. And he was made king of Israel. But Saul decided one day he became so egomaniacal that he thought everything worked through him. And God said, oh, no, you don't. As a matter of fact, he, he went into the temple and took over something that only the priest was allowed to do. And Saul goes into the house of God and said, hey, I'm, hey, listen, I'm big in this church. I'll do it my way. God says, oh, no, you don't. The Bible says God rejected Saul. And then God sent this young man by the name of Sam, this prophet by the name of Samuel that was birthed by Hannah. God sends Samuel to Bethlehem to anoint to the house of Jesse, who was a descendant of King David. He sends Jesse or Samuel to Jesse's house and he says you go there because I want you to anoint the next king of Israel. So one of you is going to be the next king of Israel. Right? Wrong. So Samuel goes. He says where are your sons? Bring them forward. I could read it but it says he brought all the seven sons. There were seven there. Samuel, under the anointing of God, ready to anoint the new king. He's got his horn of oil. He's ready to pour the oil over top of their head. And I could do that this morning if you guys would like. I could pour some oil over each of you. No, I won't do that. So he goes to the, he goes to the eldest and he starts from the eldest down. So you get to be the oldest and you get to be the youngest. Oh, see, isn't that wonderful? Amen. And he starts at the eldest, and he goes to him. And I can just see, I can, I can see Samuel. I can see Samuel doing something like this. <laughs> By the way, you smell great. <laughs> That's not him. Not her. <laughs> like your cologne. <laughs> it's not him. <laughs> Close, but not it. Not her. It's not him either. <laughs> Chanel number five. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> That's not it. That's not it. That's not her. And he ends up with the youngest, all seven. Nope, not him. Not her. Now that's my take on it because you hear what I'm getting ready to say. Samuel says, is there another? He said, is there another? He said, I have, I have come before each of your sons or each of your children have been brought before me and not one of them is the one. Do you have another? And Jesse says, well, <laughs> yeah. 
I've got one over there, but he's with the sheep. He's with the sheep. Bring him to me because I'm not going to rest until you do. Come on, David. So they go get David out of the sheepfold and bring him in front of Samuel. Now remember, Samuel there is to anoint the next king of Israel. And he brings David before Jesse. By the way, don't you love this young man's shirt? I told it. Hey, Sarah, there's the hoodie I could preach in right there. She's been wanting me to preach in a hoodie one day. I'll do it if I can get one like that. Listen, he said. But notice what, notice what happens. Here, here we go. You ready? It's David now. That's him. That's the one. You say, well, what in the world are you? Are you crazy, Pastor? No. You hear me. And it's where I want you to, I want you to end up today. It's where we're going to close this message and this service. You see, God turned barrenness into birthing. God in our church is starting to turn barrenness into birthing. That's what he's doing. When the focus of the church changes to souls and we get on our knees and we get to the altar and we start weeping and praying and crying for souls and lives, your children, my children, our families... And we make the house of God and we prepare it like a birthing room. We're going to make this place a birthing room. It's, this is going to be, what, what do they call those places where you go to have kids? Who said, who said hospital? <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. That's true. A maternity room. A delivery room. Samuel said that's the one because he smells like sheep. Hold on, church. Don't laugh too long because you need to let the Holy Spirit get a hold of you right there. We smell too much like religion. We don't smell like sheep anymore. Amen. Bless God. Bro. The church, we, we smell too like too much like dead, still, dry religion. No wonder. Amen. We need to smell like sheep. You say, well, pastor, that sounds gross. I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. Behold, one day a man walked down to the River Jordan. You folks can sit down right now. Thank, thank you all for being so wonderful. Listen, one day... A man walked down to the Jordan River and he met a man by the name of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was ready to baptize him. And before John baptized him, he said, Behold, the Lamb of, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. The Lamb of God smell like sheep, Pastor Renfro, I said, yes, we need to smell like sheep. Jesus is the Lamb of God, and we're born, amen, into the kingdom of heaven through Jesus Christ. We need to smell more like Jesus. Jesus didn't smell like dead religion. He didn't smell like religion that was self-centered, self-focused. And, and Amen. He smelled like sheep. Isaiah said he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. And we all like sheep have gone astray but the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Listen folks, we need to smell like sheep in the church. This is going to be the, the, the Hannah church is on the way in. The Eli church is on the way out. Eli was judgmental. He was legalistic in his outlook and he missed it. And then he humbled himself and pronounced the blessing upon Hannah. 
I will tell you, the day is coming and it now is that that which was traditional will rise up, amen, and it will bless the, the, the Hannah church. It will bless the new paradigm of God. And as the Lord said to Israel, He said the glory of the, the, glory of the former shall be greater than that of the latter. The glory of the church when Jesus comes is going to be greater than the glory of the one, amen, that started 2,000 years ago. The Holy Spirit said it's time to give birth. We're the Hannah church, Eli church out. That's why things have changed. What did God have to do? He had to send a pandemic. He's got a, he's, he, 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 uh, he allowed the pandemic to happen. If God needed to send it, he could have sent it. Don't know that he did. He could have. But I tell you what, God allowed it. And God's allowed some other things to happen in this world. What's he trying to do? He's trying to get us to focus on the necessity of coming to the cross of Jesus Christ, bearing precious seed with us. And he said, if you'll come to the altar, ladies, if you'll come if you'll come to the altar and you'll come weeping and you'll come with your seed, he said, you'll doubtless come again, amen, bringing your sheaves, your harvest with you. You'll bring your children with you. I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking to the church today. I believe this, this was a revelation to me. It was eye-opening. I sat there and I wept. I wept as I thought, God, that's exactly what you're talking to the church. That's where we are. We're not having church like usual anymore. Things have changed. Amen. Worship is changing. Everything's changing. And I'm going to tell you there's a reason it's changing because the focus has to go back on God 